How important is the Holy Spirit in the life of the church today? During the week, Julie and I were watching a TV show and there was a scene when the main character had to hold his breath as he escaped a building that was full of this deadly poisonous gas. And I did what I always do when somebody on screen is holding their breath, is I take a big breath and try and hold mine for the length of time it took him to escape the building. And even though he was having to run at full speed and I was just sitting there on the couch, I wasn't able to hold it for very long at all. And I was interested and I looked up what the world record for voluntarily holding your breath is. And it's held by a man called Budimir Sobat. And at the end of March, he held his breath for 24 minutes and 33 seconds. That's like as long as the service has been up to this point. And please don't try this at home. Uh, he's, you know, been training and doing it for years. But of course, that amount of time by itself is not particularly impressive. Because you can go days without water, you can go weeks without food, and the world record for not having a bath is over 60 years. <laughs> Breathing is necessary for life. In the Hebrew Bible, the word for spirit is exactly the same as the word for breath. And just like our bodies need breath to live, so our church needs to be filled with the Holy Spirit for its life. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking at the essential questions about church. And if you've missed the first few parts, they're all available on our website. But so far, we have seen that church is about people, that God has called us to experience his love within community, and we exist to love God, to love others, and to make disciples. But we can't do that without the help of the Holy Spirit. That if we want to have a worship that is meaningful, if we want to have a community that overcomes division, and if we want to have a mission that is fruitful, if we try and do that by ourselves in our own strength, it's like trying to hold your breath. We need the Holy Spirit. So we're going to think a little bit about what the Holy Spirit does. And today's uh, question is, what is the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church today? And there are three things that I want to highlight. And first is that the Holy Spirit dwells in the church. In the Old Testament, the presence of God was experienced in the tabernacle in the wilderness and then later on in the temple in Jerusalem. Now, of course, in one way, God is everywhere, but there was something special about the temple of God. After it was built, we read in 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 11, that a cloud descended on the temple and the glory of the Lord filled it. The temple was heaven on earth. It was the meeting place between God and his creation. But that glory was in the Holy of Holies and it was kept away by a curtain. So for most people, they were close to the presence of God, but they were never able to enter into it fully. But now, after Christ's death and his resurrection, through his Holy Spirit, the church, as in the people of God, are the dwelling place for God's presence. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22, it says, And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his Spirit. Because of the Holy Spirit, today we are experiencing what very few people did in the Old Testament, the glorious presence of God. And after weeks of being at home, we know that there is something special about being together, meeting in the name of Jesus. And today, if you go home and you find that you have a little bit more joy, you have more hope, 
you have more peace, more faith, you've been encouraged, that is because you have been in the presence of God. But of course, there are some things that can prevent us from experiencing the presence of God. There are ways in which we can kind of put that curtain back and maybe keep God away. It can be unconfessed and unrepentant sin because sin is always a barrier to God. And even though Jesus has died to set us free, sometimes we can hold on to our sin. There are things that we don't want to admit to that we know are doing wrong or are trying to hide from God. We don't want him to see certain things. Or maybe it's that God is present, but we're the ones who are absent. We're here physically, but our hearts and minds are somewhere else. We're filled with worries. Or our mind is on the argument we had last week. Or we're thinking about what we're having for lunch. Or we're looking around to see who's had their haircut. Or sometimes it's because we have low expectations. We need to come to church with the attitude that we are entering into God's presence and expecting to meet with him. The Holy Spirit dwells in the church and the Holy Spirit unites the church. Relationships of any kind are hard. Even when you've lots in common with somebody and there is love, it can be a struggle because there's still differences. We have different opinions, different points of view, different attitudes, different desires, different expectations, different experiences. And in a community, those difficulties can be multiplied. But when you think about the global church, it's got to be the most diverse collection of people in the world. Even here in St. Andrews, we're different ages, different backgrounds, We've got different family and marital statuses, different nationalities, different political views, different hobbies, different forms of education. But the great news is, is that if our faith is in Jesus, then we share in the one spirit. This is uh, Ephesians chapter four, verses um, three to six. Paul writes, as a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. The Holy Spirit unites, he reconciles, he heals relationships, he casts out fear with perfect love. It doesn't happen in an instant, but the Holy Spirit is at work binding us together in peace. And you know, the sign of a mature church is not one that has no differences, but one that has no division, despite its many differences. The Holy Spirit dwells in the church. The Holy Spirit unites the church. And thirdly, the Holy Spirit empowers the church. Just before Jesus ascended to heaven, he gave his disciples a task. And we thought about it last week, but let me read again from the end of Luke chapter 24. Jesus told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. So Christ died and he rose again for the salvation and the hope of all humanity. But the only way the world will know about this is if the disciples do their job and fulfill this task that they have been given. But humanly speaking, you expect them to fail, wouldn't you? Because when you think about it, these 11 men were uneducated. They were an unnatural mix of, of fishermen, of tax collectors, of religious fundamentalists. They were filled with doubts and fear. 
They had a proven track record of crumbling under pressure, but yet would argue openly over which one of them was the greatest. From all outward appearances, they were doomed to fail. You would expect the group to implode and this Jesus movement to quickly fade to nothing. But now, today, more than 2,000 years later, the number of the church is reached billions from every corner of this planet. How is that possible? It's because they were clothed with the power of the Holy Spirit as promised. And Jesus finished off his commission by saying this, stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. It would be like watching somebody push a car up a hill and you think they're never going to be able to get it to the top. And then somebody comes along, fills it with petrol, they start the engine and off they go. And as we read earlier, on the day of Pentecost, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit. And then Peter preached repentance and forgiveness of sins in the name of Jesus. And thousands came to faith. And the church is still growing today by that same power. You know, I think our church today is facing just as many challenges as the church did at the beginning. And at times it can feel like we're surrounded by a variety of enemies who are threatening our worship, threatening our community, threatening our mission. So what do we do? We breathe deep. We breathe deep in the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Because the same Holy Spirit that was poured out onto the apostles on the day of Pentecost lives in us. And when we breathe in him, he will unite us and he will empower us. As we close, I want us to pray uh, an ancient prayer, which simply says, come Holy Spirit. So let's bow our heads and let's pray to God. Lord Jesus, you have called us to be a community of worshippers. You have commanded us to love one another And you have commissioned us to be witnesses of your truth. Thank you that we are not alone in being and doing these things. But you have given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us. So we pray, come Holy Spirit. Fill us with your presence. Unite us in love. Empower us to share the gospel. In the name of Jesus, amen.